I left Israel with my five-year-old son, Amir, and came to America and stayed. Higher education might have been somewhat of an excuse. Sadness, the second characteristic of my upbringing was a mix of sadness and happiness. A family was small, one uncle, one grandfather, and one step-grandmother. A small family meant no place, no places to go and visit. That was the hardest part. I felt homebound, except for the weekly Shabbat visits to my grandparents, a 30 minute walk from our home in Holon. My best childhood memories are of that walk to and from Saba's place and the time we spent with Saba and Pesia. We were all together. Even my father stopped his work. He was working all the time, as much as I can remember, to provide for his family, fixing municipal water mains during the day and taking on private plumbing jobs after hours. At Sabbath's place, we children were the center of attention. <coughs> Between the Shabbos meals, my grandparents would sing in Yiddish songs from his childhood, and me and my sister would dance on the living room carpet and jump over the beds. The songs were sweet, melancholic, and nostalgic of a lost life. There were undeniable, uh, these were undeniably joyful yet sorrowful moments. Grandpa seemed sentimental but unwavering. Pesia, on the other hand, often broke in tears. She lost her husband and two infant children in the war. There was something too terrible to tell about the way her children died. My sister and I became her, their reincarnation of her children, and she cherished us and loved us dearly. We returned her love. Pesia came to be a model of sacrifice, compassion, and survival for me. Holidays were particularly filled with that mix of joy and sorrow. Very distant relatives who by default became close family members and other survivors of Koso, who became extended family, joined the long table and grandpa's small living room, dined and song, sang songs. There were also many sighs, eye contacts, and nods amongst the adults. There were hidden lines we kids were not allowed to cross, a world we were not supposed to enter. Family history began in Israel and the start of a new chapter that which we children epitomized and in which our central responsibility was to endure. Endurance and survival, the third characteristic of my upbringing, affected all walks of life. We stood for the symbol of victory over destruction, the proof that they survived despite all odds. There was a sacred duty for us to marry and to bear children fast. In fact, this duty pervaded the, the state of Israel as a whole. But for the Holocaust survival families, that duty was utterly tangible. One of the manifestations of my parents' survival instincts was that they were angry when we got hurt, when we hurt ourselves. <laughs> Anything that endangered our health was a personal threat. And we were always to blame. Often the outcome was to hide and internalize physical and emotional pain. I know I have inherited this tendency as a mother. The dining table in particular provoked that survival instinct along with the attendant anger. Since I was a picky eater, I hated onion cooked or uncooked eggplant, zucchini, among many other foods, and often let that food sit in my plate, my mother's recurrent utterance in response was, we did not have what to eat, we ate grass. That, of course, induced a sense of guilt about that which I was not responsible for. Somehow I managed to free myself from this imperative, the ultimate assurance was that my son's regular reminder to our guest at the table was, you do not have to finish your food at our home. 
Competitiveness was also a requisite for survival and education was the place I turned my competitiveness into action. The fourth and last aspect of my upbringing is suspicion, a distrust of the outside world. This is perhaps the most difficult of the four and it's taking me the longest to fight. I had tried constantly to prove to myself that the world isn't the dangerous place that my parents portrayed it to me and that people are necessarily or essentially well-intentioned and can be trusted. My father in particular has managed to estrange and isolate himself from friends and even if family members, always blaming them for the situation. Widowed at uh, almost 40 years ago and now at age 88, he never married again, in part because of this distrustful attitude. Occasional temp uh, uh, loss of temper and a general pessimism is part and parcel of this distrust. Having immigrated to the U.S. in 1987 with my son, I now ponder the legacy of the Holocaust on him. What kind of reference does he have to anchor my family's Holocaust history? Could it be the movies? During one of my uncle's visit to Ames 20 years ago, as we sat down for an evening in which we agreed, he agreed to tell us his memory of the Holocaust as a seven-year-old, my son stopped him as he began his story and said, wait, I need my popcorn. I do not mean to disapprove of Amir or myself by default. I simply try to understand the way generations evolved and our history and memory with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. Uh, tonight's program is the result of planning by members of the Iowa Council for Holocaust Education, and specifically the subgroup within that composed of relatives of Holocaust survivors. So we thank them for the efforts they, they expended in conceptualizing and putting tonight's program together. Also, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask that sometime during the spring or the summer that you take a trip downtown to the Capitol and look at the Holocaust Memorial on the Capitol grounds and um, spend some time there and think about its legacy, the role that American, Americans and Iowans played in saving people, and um, we appreciate everybody's support for that. Uh, my pleasure now to call upon my friend, Dr. Harry Broad. It is a distinct honor to be here with you this evening. I'm a child of Holocaust survivors, and actually I think and speak of myself as a child of temporary Holocaust survivors, by which I mean that my parents survived the war years themselves, but they died younger than I think they would have had they not had to endure the hardships and traumas of those years. They survived but temporarily, as far as I'm concerned. My mother died at age 48 and my father at 58. And I can tell you what a milestone it was for me personally when I surpassed the age to which my father had lived. Um, I grew up in a community of survivors and I'm very aware that those for whom the tally ended in 1945 closed the books way too early. We need to consider those who did not live the fullness of their years because of the hardships and traumas of those years. Um, I grew up in New York City, uh, and I can tell you one of the moments at which I became acutely aware of the distinctiveness of my background. I teach at the University of Northern Iowa, and occasionally I teach courses where a unit on the Holocaust is part of the course. 
So when that's the case, I will integrate my family history with the much broader history that the students are learning. And I tell them at age 13, Jewish tradition, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, most of them have heard of that. Um, and I tell them of the story of the first time I was at a bar mitzvah of an American Jewish friend. Since, I, like I said, I grew up in a community of survivors. Um, and my American Jewish friend had four living grandparents at his bar mitzvah. And I had never seen such a thing in a Jewish family. Nobody I knew had four living grandparents. If there was one, you were lucky that that generation had been murdered. And I remember my jaw dropping when I saw that. And I see my students take that in. Iowa students who are very close to their families. And I can have told them all sorts of stories. And they can have read all sorts of books. And that hits them in a way that nothing else does. Um, I'll tell you some about the stories of both of my parents. Uh, my father was a Polish Jew. I uh, grew up in the town of Lezhensk, Poland, near Krakow. Um, told me that he spent four years hiding in the woods without a roof over his head, um, uh, living uh, off raw potatoes one stole from the fields of farmers. Um, and hearing you speak about food reminded me it's been a long time since I heard the line, in the war we ate raw potato peels. Um, but that, that very strongly came to mind when I was listening to you. Um, he told me he, could, he uh, was sometimes by himself, sometimes with a shifting group of people. He told me one time the group, as, as he put it, was two communists, two bank robbers, and me. <laughs> um, he met up with the organized resistance at the end of the war. Um, when the Soviet army had already liberated that area of Poland on its way to Berlin, um, he came out of hiding, was uniquely suited to be of assistance to the Soviet army. He was the only one who had stayed around uh, the town for the entire time and was able to say this one collaborated, this one helped, uh, give them a sense of who was who. Um, the way I got the story, um, after he was out in public in the liberated town, he was recognized by someone he'd known from childhood, who basically the reaction was, you're still alive, and shot him. Um, one can only describe this as a local anti-Semite. Um, my father was wo wounded in the leg. The Soviet army took him with them to Berlin because uh, he'd been of assistance. Um, by the time he got there, um, the leg had turned gangrenous and had to be amputated. Uh, so my father had an artificial left leg from below the knee down. Um, in the hospital where that amputation was done is where he met my mother. She was a nurse at that hospital in Berlin. Now, this was the Jewish hospital of Berlin. And here I have to stop for a moment and say every Holocaust survivor story is absolutely extraordinary and unique and unbelievable. And given that, my mother's story is still unusual. Not better or worse, but unusual. I've talked to people who know a good deal about the period and are surprised to learn that there was a Jewish hospital functioning openly in Berlin throughout the entire period, staffed mostly by Jews um, who op were open, uh, allowed by the, by the regime. Um, this was the Jewish hospital of Berlin. This was a hospital operated by um, the Jewish community, not, not exclusively for Jews, but um, there it was. Um, there's a very interesting book by Daniel Silver called Refuge in Hell, how Berlin's Jewish hospital outlasted the Nazis. Um, Silver contacted me when he was writing the book. I was able to tell him some stories he hadn't heard 
and confirm some others that he had heard. Um, a number of things went on in that hospital. Part of the Nazi strategy was to keep up the front, that what was going on wasn't really going on, that Jewish life went on in Germany. So keeping this official organization going was part of that. Um, some of you will know the history. Uh, in German, this was the Reichsvereinigung der Juden in Deutschland. The Reich Organization of Jews in Germany was headquartered at the hospital. Small linguistic shifts matter. Before the Nazi seizure of power, this was the organization, organization of German Jews. But by the Nazi definition, that's a contradiction in terms. There's no such thing as a German Jew. You're either German or Jewish. So the organization of German Jews became the organization of Jews in Germany. Families who had been there for generations upon generations upon generations were redefined as foreigners. So this organization was headquartered at the hospital. The hospital was actually a compound of seven buildings with an uh, interior courtyard. The courtyard was used as an assembly point for, for deportations to the camps. Uh, while the captive population was visible to the larger German population, fed, clothed, medical care, um, all, of, all of that. Um, my mother, twice, was in that courtyard with the placard around her neck, ready to be deported. Um, by that time, however, the hospital staff had developed relationships with some of the Nazi guards. Bribes were paid, and my mother got out. Um, there was, the hospital was used as a prison for select prisoners. Um, there was the m mother of someone who'd been a Jewish childhood friend of a Nazi officer who was sheltered at the hospital. Some people were being kept for prisoner exchanges. There are all sorts of unusual circumstances that came together to keep this place opening and functioning. Apparently the Nazis were afraid of epidemics spreading from the, from the ghettos and the, and the camps. One couldn't be treated at the Aryan hospitals anymore. Um, suicide was illegal. Jews who attempted suicide uh, would be brought to the hospital to be nursed back to health so they could be properly executed. Now, in the middle of all of this, that's another sort of wrinkle to get one's head around. Um, my mother told me stories of Adolf Eichmann in charge of the final solution, coming to the hospital, um, having his quotas to fill, and taking people out of hospital beds, taking people, taking staff, uh, going around the room, going, you, you, the soldiers, clipboard, taking, taking names. Uh, there was one time he met with the staff, and again, you know, you, you going around the room, and my mother noticed that uh, he seemed to be seizing upon people uh, who were maybe fat or wore glasses, and my mother fit both those descriptions. So she bent down in front of a taller person in front of her and was passed over when Eichmann's gaze went around the room. Every time we talk about Passover, I remember that <laughs> passing over there. Um, so I grew up with all these stories. I know that my father's sister survived on forged papers as a Christian. Christian family took her in. Uh, documents my father helped her secure. And um, when they met again after the war, um, my father uh, told his sister, they're all gone, don't ask me about it. Um, my mother's parents and brothers were murdered. Uh, she told me her father was always proud of the distinguished service cross from his World War I service in the German, in the German army. Again in German, Bundesverdienstkreuz zweiter Klasse, distinguished service cross, second, <coughs> second class in the, dr in the dr dresser drawer, very proud of it. Um, that uh, distinguished service earned my grandparents uh, um, a trip to concentration camp Theresienstadt instead of directly to one of the death camps. Um, my grandfather died in Theresienstadt. Um, 
I had people who don't understand how this worked. Um, in Theresienstadt, was a so-called model camp outside, outside Prague in Czechoslovakia. There was actually a post office. People could send out cards and receive packages. Um, I have in my possession postcards from my mother's mother to my mother from the camp. These are form cards. Uh, I gratefully acknowledge the receipt of your package and a date and a salutation and signature. And my grandmother knew that the cards would be read to, you know, messages shouldn't get out, but she took a risk that cards would not be read that carefully. Um, so in the date, it says uh, 27th of Kese. Kese is not one of the German months of the year. Kese is the German word for cheese. Um, so she's sending out messages what she wants to be sent in the camps. And another date is the 4th of Onion. Um, and it's signed Johanna Großhandtasche, Johanna Large Handbag. Um, and this over and over again. Um, one of the cards uh, my mother received, the, say, the return ad address on the back, um, instead of simply saying Johanna Schiftan, said Johanna Schiftan Witwe, Johanna Schiftan Widow. That's how my mother learned her father died in the camp. Um, my grandmother was on one of the last transports from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz-Birkenau. We know that those people never enter, entered the main body of the camp. They went directly to the gas chambers. Um, so talk about my own experience. I grew up with stories and stories. Um, much of the presence of the Holocaust was the absence of who wasn't around the dinner table. Um, this was a very, very strong presence in my family, an awareness of who was not there. Um, so there's much more to tell. I will stop there. Um, and let me thank you with, with words that may be a bit of a peculiar connection. Um, some of you will know um, the, the, the film Yankee Doodle Dandy, which has no particular connection to that of which we speak this, the, the, this evening. But there's a line in it uh, spoken by Jimmy Cagney as George M. Cohan. Uh, which is spoken several times in the film. It was the um, ending thank you of the, the vaudeville team, the, f the four co-heads, where, where he started his show business career. Um, he says it several times in the film. One is at, at his father's deathbed in a particularly moving scene, for, the, for those of you who remember that. So um, in the words of Jimmy Cagney speaking as George M. Cohan, in the film Yankee Doodle Dandy, I say to you, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, and I thank you. Thank you. She was caught and executed uh, shortly after crossing over. Uh, but this is not a song or a poem of pain, but one of hope. Eli, Eli, Shero Yigamer Eoraham, Aho Vehayam, Rishru Shel Hamayim, Beraka Shamayim, Tfirat Hadam, Aho Vehayam, Rishru. Shel Hamayim, Berak Hashamayim, Tvirat Hadam. O God, my God, I pray that these things never end. The sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayers of the heart, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, 
the crash of the heavens, the prayers of the heart. The origin of the song is unknown, but it gained its greatest significance during the Holocaust when it was on the mouths of Jews who were paraded to the death chambers. And hundreds of thousands of Jews would sing this song, and eyewitness accounts tell us that the music would decrescendo as the gas choked the singers.